Hello, you're watching Cherry Red TV. My name's Mark Powell and I'm a label manager for Esoteric Recordings and I'm pleased to say that with me um, today is guitarist uh, Peter Banks. Mm -hmm. Hello Peter, it's nice for you to come in. It uh, is. <laughs> you've uh, had a long and varied career with mm -hmm. lots of uh, bands as a respected guitarist from bands going back to The Sin, to Yes, to Flash, to yeah. various other uh, session um, sessions that you've done. So if it's possible, I'd like to take you back all the way back to the early days. Very early days. The very early days of uh, The Sin, basically, and, and uh, how that band actually came together. Because obviously that eventually evolved into Mabel Greer's Toy Shop and then Yes. But... Yeah. Um, we're talking a long time ago, I, I guess 60... 65 or 66. Um, it's all a little hazy now. Um, it was the first serious band that I was in. I'd been in several bands before that, but it was the first band that actually um, had a van <laughs> and, um, and were doing you know, quite regular gigs. And um, I joined completely by accident. I was in, um, in Denmark Street in, in London, uh, which was... Kind of the the you know Tin Pan Alley of of the music business, and there's a little coffee bar there, um, and I met, and I can't remember how I did it. I met Chris Squire uh, in the street, and I, I was introduced to him by by the drummer of of Sin, and it was I met Chris, and then it turned out that uh, they were looking for a new guitar player. They were sneakily trying to get rid of their previous guitar player. This sounds like a yes deal, but, but you know, very, very coldly. And they said, did I want to join? Uh, I don't remember auditioning. And then there was a whole series of gigs that I went to see uh, what they were playing and check out what the guitar player was, was playing and uh, knowing the fact that I would replace him. Uh, and that was my first introduction <laughs> to to the horrors and, and manipulation that, that that go on, you know, not not in the business, but but with musicians as well. Um, but anyway, I joined and um, inherited a, a Rickenbacker guitar from the old guitar player, and Chris had his Rickenbacker, and um, we started off doing. Um, a lot of Motown stuff, a lot of Motown stuff, um, and songs by the Impressions, and um, heavily influenced by, by the Action, mm. who were playing at the Marquee, and, and we just thought they were wonderful. And so that's how we started off, but always with a, uh, a three-piece harmony, uh, with myself and Chris and, and the keyboard player. Um, and then gradually we started writing our, our own material, uh, particularly uh, the keyboard player who was... Um, he was the proper musician in the band because he could actually read music and, and um, he used to talk to me about Stravinsky and Stockhausen and, and um, probably one of the reasons that I later got, got into classical music. But uh, we started writing our own material and then when... Drug taking began and, and it came into 67. Um, we wrote a rock opera, um, which a lot of people were rumoured rumor to be doing, but we actually performed it on stage um, and it was called embarrassingly Flower Man. And we had costumes um, and we premiered this thing at the marquee uh, and it was... <sighs> I found it particularly embarrassing. <laughs> you know, I wasn't really into to getting dressed up, and and, and we oh we we each had um, our identities were a flower, and I was Peter Buttercup, and had to sing this this song. I was absolutely mortified by the whole thing. And then later on, about a few months later, we did a gangster um, rock opera. Um, or oratorio, I suppose, would be be more correct. 
Um, and we dressed up in these gangster outfits, and it was kind of an Al Capone thing. But we'd copied the idea from, from The Move, uh, who were also playing at the marquee, because The Move had, had all these gangster suits on. Um, and the whole sin thing was, was it, it, um, good time, a good time for me, because I learned a lot... Uh, not only about playing, but 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 in being on stage and, and learning to try and relax a little more, because I was always very very shy on stage and and, and usually nervous ninety percent of the time. But sin was a good um, it, it was a good training camp, I suppose. Because when you when you that, with that band, didn't you take part in some of the sort of the great psychedelic? gigs of the time were you yeah I think we played the roundhouse and uh, UFO club and um, we supported Jimi Hendrix at the marquee uh, well we had a marquee residency uh, so we were the support band for everybody you know we supported the who we supported the move we supported the nice um, and I think we had about three residencies at the Marquee and then gradually uh, graduated to having our own night. And um, that went on for, for quite a few months. So we, were, were, we had other bands supporting us. Um, and it became a bit of a chore, you know, because we'd do, do one, one gig a week at the Marquee and it was like, oh... We're going to play here again. And the yes. same people were, were there. Um, it's not trying to be disparaging about, about them. There, there used to be a, a girl that ran the Sin fan club, and she would sit in the front row and do her knitting. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know. And that was, wasn't exactly rock and roll. It wasn't, wasn't too inspiring. But um, when we first played at the Marquee, I was absolutely thrilled because I'd been going there on, on Tuesday nights to, to watch The Who and was very much a fan. And, and my one ambition was uh, to play at the Marquee. I'd never dreamed that I would. And then, you know, a year and a half later, I'm like thinking, I don't want to play here anymore. You know, it's getting boring. But um, it, it was a good introduction. And then after that, I played in about four other bands at that place, so um, spent a long time there. How did the sin then finish and Mabel Greer's toy shop come about? I don't remember how sin disbanded. Uh, the singer wanted to get into the clothing business. He was very much kind of entrepreneurial type of person. I, I think we just ended. Uh, I don't remember us breaking up. I think it just we suddenly stopped playing. Um, and then Chris had helped put this band together called Mabel Greer's Toy Shop, which, which was, and he asked me to join. And so, so there were two guitar players, bass and drums. Um, very peculiar band. Um, I hated it at, at the time. Um, I didn't like playing with another guitar player. The, the guitar player was the lead singer. Um, he wasn't the most competent guitar player around, but um, actually we weren't bad. I mean, I've listened back to some of that stuff, and we weren't bad, and we did uh, John Peel on, on the radio, and, and that, you know, we were heavily psychedelic. Um, and now, as I say, it doesn't sound as bad as I, I remembered it, but it was very uh, disorganised. Um, and and I, I was always in favour of pretty tight arrangements, you know, with with enough room to 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 solo or go off sometimes on a tangent. But I liked every, I liked to know it, what what was going to happen next. And maybe Grizz Toy Shop were pretty shambolic in that direction. Uh, but once again, it was good playing with Chris, and uh, he and I, though we have differences uh have always played together pretty good and really never had to discuss much musically at all it just slotted together so when did when did the uh formative seeds of yes when when were they when were they so um 68 summer of 68 i was in yet another band called uh the neat change 
uh, another band that had a residency at the Marquee. Um, and I got fired from the neat change on my 21st birthday, or the day before, because, um, oddly enough, uh, they, would, they wanted to go for a skinhead look, uh, you know, similar, similar to Slade, or Ambrose Slade, as they were called then. And I refused to get my hair cut. And musically, that was pretty chaotic. So I, I got kicked out. Um, I was very upset about that. Then I shaved all my hair off <laughs> <laughs> out of spite. Um, and then I knew that Chris was, was in another band. Um, and we had a phone conversation. I said, how's your band doing? And, you know, what are they called? And he says, oh, we're called Yes. And I said, well, I had that name... You know, I thought of that name a couple of years before. Um, so I kind of said, well, i better join then. And it was pretty simple. I went down to see them rehearse in a little um, little cellar underneath a, a cafe called the Lucky Horseshoe in Shaftesbury Avenue. And I thought they were terrific. And so I joined. And I, I think then we auditioned Bill, Bill Bruford. Uh, we got him out of the Melody Maker ad. And he, he joined because he said he had a premier drum kit. But it, actually, it was we were very into, into... That was the kit to have at the time. Yeah, yeah got to have a premier kit. Yeah. You know, that's the brand. Mm. And then we found out that it was a bit of an Olympic drum and it was, it'd been cobbled <laughs> together. Uh, but Bill was fantastic, you know, and uh, I thought, ah, oh, you know, because I was always uh, leaning more towards jazz. And Bill was a, a die-hard bebopper at the time. And we had a lot of... Uh, Bill taught me quite a lot about um, uh, about jazz. I didn't know him. We used to sit around and listen to John Coltrane and, uh, and Sonny Rollins and all that kind of thing. Uh, so that was that was good. And then, yes, we. I think we only rehearsed for a week or two weeks. And then we did a gig, the East Mercy camping site in uh, East Anglia, near Colchester which was a disaster. And I think the second gig was at the Marquee. And then we got a residency mm. at the Marquee, first as a support band and then as the main band. So we were back doing that again. Because when you, when you read about the history of the Marquee Club, a lot of people, um, and I know uh, Phil Collins being one of them always mm -hmm. says as well, that the, the, those early Yes gigs, a lot of people said that we were absolutely magical at the Marquee Club, the, the sort of the imagination. That I wish I'd seen them, you know. And um, they're, they're the sort of things that, that uh, people always refer to when, when they're talking about when, when the Marquee is being spoken of. At that point as well, your live show, is in, in Yes, you, you were doing very interesting cover versions of, of songs. That we were, were basically a covers band to start off. Um, the writing didn't come till... A little later. I mean, John had a lot of ideas for songs, and um, but because of the short rehearsal time, we just um, we were doing covers. We did Beatles. We did uh, a Traffic song, "Heaven Is in Your Mind." We did a thing by uh, the Fifth Dimension, um, Carpet Man. Uh, we did Eleanor Rigby, um, and they were great. Um, and the whole premise was, if we were going to do a cover, uh, let's make it sound very different to what, what you expect. Um, kind of like Vanilla Fudge were doing at, at that time. And that, that was our kind of unspoken manifesto, that, that we didn't want to sound like any other band. Certainly, um, I was desperately trying to avoid playing blues guitar licks, uh, which most guitar players were doing at that, that time. And, and I was very consciously going out, out of the way to, to avoid cliches that came from other guitar players. And, and slowly out of all this um, uh, slightly chaotic... Uh, no, I won't say chaotic. We all had very different tastes in, in, in music, uh, which was very healthy. So we would take a, a piece of music and then stick a bit of cowboy music in it, you know, so you, you want something from the Magnificent Seven. We can do that. Um, and it was just, we just cobbled together bits of everything. Let's put a bit of uh, Gustav Holst in here. Let's have a little bit of Stravinsky in here. 
Um, and for some bizarre reason, it worked. Um, and we became pretty good. Sometimes. Uh, I mean, we also often played badly. And it, it, it's... I think mostly Bill and I liked the... I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I think, uh, as though we were a very uh, pre-arranged band, uh, Bill and I used to like to go off on a tangent and extend things, and I often used to think, well, I'm not going to play the same as I played last night, I'm going to play everything completely different, uh, which for the lead singer, for John, was fantastically annoying, because he'd have all this stuff going on behind him, and I'd be throwing in little things, and Bill would be not playing on the beat um it was great it was very inventive um but very difficult for 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 singing to um but strange band we i mean we weren't really a rock band um, i don't know what we were but it was certainly um we certainly didn't sound like mm. anybody else sometimes we went too far to um not to be part of the the musical gang. Sometimes it got a little crazy, but um, pretty good times, I, I think. Uh, though personally, we we had a lot of problems. You know, every every gig there would be a, a kind of post mortem. You know, about well that was horrible. You were too loud. You were playing an F sharp when you're supposed to be playing a D natural. All that every night. You know, and, and John particularly would be haranguing us and saying, you know, this is terrible. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. Um, but kind of healthy to, mm. to, you know, you have to be a pretty strong person to be in the band. And if you didn't get your say, then you were out. I mean, which has happened to me on, on the first time because I was a bit, um, maybe a little quieter, not, not quite as, as vociferous as maybe as I should have been. So that band was He Who Shouted the Loudest got his say yeah. um but um a terrific band really because yes, I mean, you had some pretty uh major exposure but when you early on when you supported cream yeah uh, at, uh, at the albert hall for that i think we played there three or four times we we're almost like the resident band there <laughs> well we had good connections our manager roy flynn uh who managed the speakeasy um a terrific guy roy and and he ended up giving his job up at the speakeasy to manage uh, Yes full-time. Um, but, of course, he had fantastic connections. So, you know, we would get to play virtually in London, you know, where, wherever we could. And the Albert Hall was good. Um, you know, and I, I think I spent most of my time down at the speakeasy. And there'd be a fantastic rush after a gig if we are playing in Birmingham. The bar wouldn't close till till three a.m. and it'd be a fantastic rush to see if we could make the, the speakeasy before one o'clock when the restaurant closed. And of course, we'd eat there for nothing. So um, you know, we weren't exactly on a budget in those days. A budget was unheard of. Um, so I used to get free food from the speakeasy and, and free relaxation and free alcohol, and it was good. And I got to play with Jimi Hendrix and Ginger Baker and you know little jam things. Um, Great, great days, you know. And King Crimson did their, I think their first gig at the Speakeasy, and, and they were just fantastic. Um, and we realised that we had serious competition, and we went in, into intensive rehearsals for, for a few weeks because we realised that Crimson were far better than, than we were and much, much more inventive. Uh, just blew us away. But if you go back to those, uh, the even even the first Yes album. I mean, um, how quickly was that album recorded? Was Very um, five or six days. So was maybe. that essentially your live set as it was at the time? Most of those things. Or? Yeah, uh, we did a couple of songs that we never played on stage. We did a thing called Sweetness, which was the first single, which was about the most unrepre unrepresentative. Um, <laughs> of the band that you could think of. Uh, we played that a few times on stage and I was always a bit embarrassed by that. It was the quiet number. It was very good for John. Um, it was a singer's... Sounds like a contradiction, a singer's song, but it was a singer's piece of music. Um, 
but yeah, the first album was, was we really didn't, didn't know what we were doing. The producer didn't know what he was doing. Um, Bill, I don't think Bill had been in the studio before, and and he didn't even realize. Uh, he always tells us that you could get separate mixes in the headphones, and he spent most of those days hearing me very, very loud in his left ear and not hearing any drums. And I mean, that's how naive it all was. And suddenly realised three days later, oh, you can have a different ba balance in, in the headphones. But, um, and we spent about three days trying to get a Hammond organ sound. Um, <laughs> because Tony, um, we didn't have a Hammond then. Tony was playing a, a Vox Continental mm. keyboard. So we hired this Hammond organ, we couldn't, couldn't get a sound out of it. And I think Armin Ertigan, the president of Atlantic, came down on about the third day uh, to see how we were doing. And, and we really had, <laughs> we were still fiddling around with a Hammond organ, trying to, and it sounded like a, a fairground organ. You know, it was like a, a merry-go-round. It, it was just horrible. Um, and when that album was done, I, I, none of us were, were happy about it. Um, as though now I can, like, every little thing, the, the Beatles thing, sounds fantastic. Um, and a couple of others are okay, but, but really the sound was very disappointing. We, we just... Um, the recordings that we did for the BBC at that time uh, sounded better than... Not sonically better, but, but certainly played better than, than the way we played on that first album. But once again, it was you know, learning, a learning thing. So when you did time in a word, was that were you allotted a bit more? Uh, yeah, studio time. Yeah, um, and we had Eddie offered as an as an engineer who who was terrific, um, and we had a better studio, and a, yeah, a little more time. Though I don't think more than a couple of weeks, but um, we were learning more on how to piece music together instead of all playing, you know, all at the same time. We'd put bass and drums on first and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it was more con controlled. And, and we finally got the instruments to sound like real instruments. Uh, putting the orchestra on was, was something that I was never in favour of. Um, and that was disappointing because the orchestra were just doubling the parts that either I or Tony Kay would play. And that was uh, basically John's idea. And it was kind of fashionable. Deep Purple had mm. played with an orchestra. The Nice had done it. Uh, the Moody Blues had done it. So it was like, oh, we better do it as well. But um, but I can listen to that album now and, and quite enjoy it. Although making, the making of the album was pretty horrible. Because we, we were all going in different directions. And the producer of that album, who a name I will never mention because I just didn't get on with him, um, we had a big row in the studio uh, when he was asking me, could I play more like Jimmy Page? Uh, and not one of my favourite guitar players at the time. And, and this guy had never produced a band before. And he was kind of... Um, smoking buddies with John and they would have a couple of joints and, and which Bill was always um, very disgusted about um, but the basically the producer didn't like my playing and I don't think he liked me particularly and it was kind of mutual and I ended up one feverish day I threw a Rickenbacker guitar at him and uh, I think he stormed out. I don't think I stormed out, but that's how how tough it got. Um, very difficult time. Very difficult. It's funny because when you listen to the album, mm. it seems that there's a lot of inventiveness going on there that um, probably belies the tension that was that was there. So yeah, it it was kind of done under pressure, but but you know we we were pretty good at motivating ourselves, and I think some of the creative creativity came out of um, a lot of friction you know uh, we just didn't um, we didn't get on particularly well um, we all lived in the same flat as well uh, apart from Chris um, and that was sometimes you know a little uh, four room bed sit in, in, in Fulham in Munster Road 
50A Munsteru. Um, and that was kind of tense because you'd come back from a gig and if it hadn't been a particularly good gig, I mean, it'd be, um, you know, John, you haven't done the dishes, you know, and this kind of thing. <laughs> and whose turn is, is it to, to, to clean out the, the bath? You know, this, and, and that was kind of um, living a bit like students, mm. you know, with little things, you know, um, marked in the fridge, you know, don't touch my food, you know, that kind of thing. Pretty odd. A bit like, um, it was a bit like a firehouse because we'd get a sudden call and can you do a gig tonight in, in Manchester? And then it'd be all systems go. And, and so there was that constant kind of um, tense atmosphere, sometimes near panic, because we were always, we were on call all the time, you know, and wherever somebody asked us to play, we'd be there. So sometimes it'd be, yeah, literally in, in the fire engine and, and off, off to the gig. So shortly after that, you, after Time and the Words was recorded, you, you left the band. I was kicked out, yeah. 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 Um, at Luton Technical College was, was the final gig, and I didn't know. Um, I had no idea. Um, and after the gig, I was just, um, John and Chris said it might be good if, if you left. And apparently Bill and Tony didn't even know about this till after the gig. Um, and I never really found out the, the, the real reason, um, oddly enough. And even now, I still don't know. <laughs> there was, um, John once said I was more into my clothes than the, than the music. And um, I still don't know. I mean, I, mean, I, I don't care now. I mean, it's... Um, but I've been asked that question so many times, and, and uh, you know, it yes. makes no difference, really. But, yeah, I departed and then um, then joined Bloodwin Pig, or Bloodwin, as they were called, uh, which was the, the best bunch of guys that I've ever been in a band with. Just wonderful guys. Uh, musically, I, I was, you know, I was like the fly in, in the ointment. Um... And very, um, I was trying to put arrangements in, into what were basically um, simple blues songs. Um, and I was trying to, to stick things in that really didn't fit. But Blodwin we, were good, I, and I ended up with them for about six months. And we, we did a terrific session for the BBC, uh, which had never been released, and it was really good. Um, and they were such fun. You know, I, I really loved that. Um, basically, I was replacing Mick Abrams, who then want, went on to, to form mm. his own band. Uh, and, yeah, great fun time. Good. So how did you get involved with Flash? Um, this was shortly after Bloodwind Pig. and I guess I spent about a year not doing much. I'd been in, 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 in that band, Bloodwind. Um... I really didn't know what to do. Um, had no idea how I could put a band together. Never considered it. Always wanted to be uh, more of a sideman, more of a journeyman guitar player. And I had had a few offers to, to put a band together and, and I just really wasn't interested. I had no idea what I was going to do. I was still kind of uh, a little shell-shocked about my departure from Yes. I, I was, took it very badly. Um, and probably worse than I should. And I just kind of lost interest and spent a really blank year um, drinking too much, taking too many drugs, having too much fun, uh, still living in a little um, flat in Fulham. Um, and then Chris Walsh from The Melody Maker did um, a whole page article about me basically saying, why, why isn't this man working, this much underappreciated guitar player? Um, which is very sweet of him. I didn't know he was going to do that. And there were some miserable pictures taken of me uh, standing on Glastonbury tour, um, looking um, kind of lost, kind of sad. And out of that article, um, I got this guy, uh, Colin Carter, who then became Flash's singer. Uh, Chris Walsh had given... 
he called up the melody maker and, and gave them Colin my phone number, which was kind of a naughty thing to do. And this guy, Colin, said, I'm a singer, um, you should put a band together. I said, no, 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 I'm not interested. And he says, I've got your address, I'm coming over. And he was, he was there within half an hour, knocking on the door. And um, we got on so well. And simply what, what happened was he had a reel-to-reel tape machine and we wrote one song together and then started looking around for drummers and bass players. Um, and it all happened very smoothly. And we, we got a, a terrific recording deal. Uh, with enough money that we could rehearse for about three months and put everybody on some kind of retainer. And uh, we kicked off, I think sometimes we rehearsed seven days a week, and it just got very good, very good. Once we'd found the right bass player and the right drummer, and uh, we were going to have a keyboard player. I wanted Tony Cage to join. He wasn't too interested. Um... And we auditioned a lot of keyboard players, uh, Ian McDonald from Crimson. Um, and we couldn't find the right persons. So I just said, well, let's do it as, as a three-piece with, with a lead singer. And really, that, that was interesting. So I was, I had my hands literally full of, of, of having to, to play rhythm and lead and, and, and just everything uh, that I could ring out of a guitar. Um, and it was fantastic for me, you know, and I never regarded it, regarded it as my band, but it was certainly, you know, it, it meant a lot to me. It was, it was a, almost to the point of, of obsession. Um, and the music was great. So on your first album, Tony Kay did actually mm. guest on Yeah. That. Did he actually ever do any gigs with you as no. well at that point? So it was just no, I was still own. trying to get him to join because uh, we did the album be- before we'd done a gig. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, but he wasn't interested, and, and, and I just thought, OK, we'd do without. It's pretty complex music to play as a, th- as a three-piece. It was very been... well-trained, yeah. P- pretty demanding on stage. Yeah. yeah. And you uh, made an impact in America quite quite quickly. We were very lucky. Within album. six months... Um, Somebody had edited down um, a thing called Small Beginnings, which, which was quite lengthy, as, as all the Flash pieces were. And this DJ, I think in Philadelphia, oh, God, I can't remember his name, that's bad, had edited down, it down to like three and a half minutes and was playing it on the radio. And uh, it became a minor hit. It got into the top 30, and uh, all of a sudden it was like, well, guys, you're going to go to the States, and they released the album, and the first album, that did pretty well. And we were over there within six months, which was a thrill for me. I'd never been to America, and I was still in my kind of denial about yes, and I wouldn't listen to them or, or talk about them. And, and but I was itching to get to America because they they were mm. touring America, and and that was uh, personally that was I was very happy to to see Flash out there working, and we worked hard. The first tour was weeks and weeks and weeks and kept getting extended seven or eight weeks I think it was and and we played the smallest places and the biggest places we played to 30,000 people you know supporting Alice Cooper and um, and then the next night we'd be playing in to, to 50 people in in Oshkosh or, or, or Scotts Bluff Nebraska uh, it was very good training. We we just worked and worked and worked, um, and it nearly cost me my sanity. Uh, well, I mean, we got to the point where where we were working too hard. We'd never been on the road before, not not in America, but we were quite well handled. Um, but of course, the the management were just signing contracts oh you're going to play here you're going to play there and and we were doing incredibly long journeys um you know some sometimes a thousand miles a day with with like three or four flights so you go a hundred miles and then change planes and it was quite exhausting so but you know the only thing to look for i know everybody says this but the only thing to look forward to was the actual gig but it was good training and we had a lot of stamina and and drank a lot of alcohol and Mostly played remarkably well. I've still got some live tapes of of those days. And um, when we were hot, we were hot. 
And the songs got faster and faster and faster. <laughs> but uh, there was nothing else like us. You know, there really wasn't. Um, and, you know, once again, like, yes, it was... A, Flash were, were unique, you know. Because as, as you were saying to me earlier, in, the, in that short period of two and a half years, you did three albums yeah. and successive touring. Yeah. And when, when you look at that sort of in, in, the, in these times, you know, it seems a, a remarkably intense. Yeah. Four albums, including my first solo mm. one. I was going to go on to oh, that okay. in, um, in a minute, actually. I mean, in fact, with, um, your solo album, is, is a very interesting one um, because you collaborated on certain things with Jan Ackerman mm. and also uh, you had Phil Collins on yeah. playing guitar and, and Steve Hackett also guessed it. How did that album actually come about? Because it's a very interesting uh, collection of music. Well, the album is still half finished. That's not why it's called <laughs> Two Sides either, but um, um, I'd, I'd seen Focus play. We, we supported Focus in, in Holland. And I was just knocked out with Jan's playing. I was just, and this was before Focus had hit over here or in the States. So they were only known in Germany and Holland, I think. And Jan and I got together, and I, I guess he saw me play in Flash a few times. And I went to as many Focus gigs that I could. Um, and we just sat down one day, and I, I said, well, why don't we go into a studio? And we were just playing guitar. And Jan was... was he had a similar style to me, but he was so much more proficient than, than, than I was. He was a much cleaner player and, and more aggressive. And he, had a, he had a kind of uh, attack, uh, rather like Django Reinhardt. Um, Jan was a, almost the perfectly formed musician. I mean, he, he's, his classical playing was, was tremendous. His improvising was, was then, I thought, second to none. So I thought it'd be nice to, to go into the studio and, and just with two electric guitars. And that's what we did. And we, um, I think after either a flash gig or a focus gig, we went to Advision Studios and got there about 1 a.m. and just played till about 8 a.m. You know, martial amp here, martial amp there. And we just sat facing each other and played at each other uh, with no idea of what we we just improvised no discussion um and out of the, i mean it, the poor engineer had to change the tape every, every 20 minutes or every 23 minutes and the guy the tape op actually fell asleep <laughs> <laughs> you know i mean that's how boring you know it's guitar world you know and for it must have been so boring for anybody listening but out of that th those ideas really rough um and chaotic but but very challenging and out of that I thought well let's let's do an album but what went wrong with that was when Flash were doing the third album Capitol Records in their infinite wisdom said why don't we have the third Flash album and your solo album come out on the same day and I hadn't finished mine and um, so what happened was in the making of the third Flash album I, I would spend daytimes working with Flash and then nighttimes doing my Banks album and going to another studio. And this went on for like two, two weeks, three weeks. Um, my stomach's rumbling. Um, a lot of... Um, so I was just running myself ragged. And, and really, the third Flash album, I didn't... I like my playing on it, but there's some pieces that I don't participate as much as I wished I had because I wasn't there, I was in, in Wembley recording my solo thing. Um, so the solo album is kind of half, two-thirds finished. Uh, and the side two um, is basically just jamming with, with uh, Ray Bennett, Flash's bass player, and Phil on drums. Um, and Yan still hates that. Whenever I see him, he still says, why did you release that? It's horrible. But side one... Is is fully formed and and I like a lot. So that must be quite a quite an incredible pace to do to mm. think about two creative projects like that at yeah. the same time. But you know it's good to work under pressure, and I think also at that time we went to Australia for one show in Melbourne, one show. So we flew there, we had a day there, and I think we flew back the next day. <laughs> in 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 the middle, I think in the middle of recording the album. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. 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 So would you say in the end that sort of because of the workload, did that contribute to Flash sort of burning out when it did? We'd done four American tours and we died out of lack of interest, really. Uh, managed, we, we desperately needed a, a proper manager, which we didn't have. Um, we did a disastrous fourth tour. Uh, I think the agency went bankrupt and, and disappeared with a, with a lot of cash. We were showing up for gigs that, that, that didn't exist. Uh, we found out a couple of times that we were supposed to be playing in two places on the same night, you know, hundreds of miles apart. Um, it just it got crazy. Um, a lot of there's a lot of friction in the band. Um, I was traveling. I just went a little, a little. I was having my first nervous breakdown, but didn't realize it. Um, uh, the band was still playing okay, but we had these long. We'd have a week off, you know, and you can't do that when you're on tour. It gets expensive, you know, because you're spending a week in in a hotel and and you're just sitting around like this and and spending the bar tab and 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 the food tab and. Um, I'm slowly coming around to the reason why we broke up, but what what happened was because of or, or, the last three gigs that we did before we broke up, I I got very angry because I we were we were playing uh, to an audience, uh, we were supporting Three Dog Night, who were even then a pretty successful pop band. It wasn't our kind of audience, and we would come on before they came on, and the first ten. 12 rows were mums and dads with their fingers in their ears and, and kids and they just hated Flash and it, it, it demoralised the band and yeah, the last three gigs I, I t and I'd be like doing this and throwing the guitar up and yeah I mean I was always you know very visual and I would turn around and, and a couple of times I saw the singer with his back to the audience and the bass player and this, I was furious, you know, because you just don't do that, no matter how the audience is. Um, and I had... Um, I was spending a lot of time in L.A. between the gigs, and I'd fallen in love, and I was going to get married, and I was taking my obnoxious girlfriend around on kind of like a John and Yoko thing, you know, um, and staying in different hotels. Sometimes they'd never see me until ten minutes before the show, and then I'd magically appear. Where is he? You know, and I, I don't know. And I was just um, not in a good space. Um, certainly drinking too much, um, and I was addicted to Valiums, and not not in a good place. Remarkably, I was still playing very well, but but I just went a little nuts, and it became a spinal tap scenario and we broke up in in the Hilton Hotel in Albuquerque um, I said I was going to leave and and, uh, and then later at 4 a.m. I called up the rest of the guys and said no I didn't mean it let's fin we only had four more gigs to do I think let's finish the tour let's go back to, to England and let's get a proper manager let's get this sorted out um, and then the next morning uh, or afternoon uh, very hungover, I was sitting in the um, the coffee shop in the hotel, and I could see the lobby, and there were all the guys getting in the car, and I went, where are you going? And they said, we're going back to England. So they left me <laughs> in Albuquerque, um, and I went, well, what, what, what do you mean you're going back? You know, I... I We've got four more gigs to do. And they, they just went. And they went back to L.A. and then, then back to England. And so it was all a shambles. And then when I got back to London, uh, this was after our manager asking me to sign away uh, a piece of my publishing so he would get me a plane ticket. And I just went, no, 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 no. <laughs> and I spent a couple of weeks in L.A. trying to figure out um, how, how to get home. And went back and had a meeting with the band, and they just said, well, we don't want to play with you, we can do better without you. And then the band broke up, sadly. Um, I think if we'd stay together, we either would have made it very well or just just split us under. But um, I think if we just stuck it out, it, we were only going for just over two years. 
uh, if we'd stuck it out for another two years, I, I think we'd um, been pretty successful. But uh, a great shame. So after that, you um, had a band called Empire mm -hmm. for a bit, and um, you you moved to America. Yeah. Well, Empire Empire was going to be Flash, and we had the Flash's bass player, um, and that went wrong because he and I are not the same kind of people. And uh, one day I caught him in bed with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so you know you could see that wasn't going to happen. Yeah, and I, in, in '76 I, m I moved to the states. Um, throughout all kinds of chaos, um, I had all my furniture stolen. Uh, I had my guitar stolen. Uh, my clothes were cut up, um, not by Flash, but by one person um, in Flash. And eventually, I just I, I was living in 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 a flat in Victoria in kind of abject poverty and, uh, and I just thought I'm, I'm going to go to America so I went to Los Angeles uh, with one guitar and a suitcase and two phone numbers and ended up living there for, for many years um, kind of a brave thing to do mm. uh, not live there but I mean just go there with, with virtually no contacts and six months later after sleeping on, on many floors and many sofas and a couple of garages of, of these people that became dear friends. Um, I, was, I was homeless and uh, just sleeping somewhere different every night. And, and my, office, my office was uh, a phone box outside the Tropicana Motel, where Tom Waits was living at, at the time. Um, and I'd hang out behind, by this call box, just waiting for, you know, for record companies to call me back and that kind of thing. Uh, so, yeah, didn't have a phone. Um, and then six months later, I um, got a deal for Empire. Um, I, I, if I can backtrack a little, I, we had done a, an Empire album in London in 74, I think, about a year after Flash, um, which never got released. And that had Phil Collins on drums. And a terrific band, actually. All, all the guys are very good. Great disappointment, and we had uh, my my girlfriend, and then became my wife, was was the singer of Empire, and we worked long and hard on on doing that album, uh, and it never got released. So I was very um, what well, disappointed is putting it mildly, but I was very um, I got very cynical about that, and and so. When I went to the States, um, got the new deal for Flash, and then um, um, called up the bass player. Sorry, the new deal for Empire. Um, and then the singer in the band, my wife, didn't want to do the band. She'd gone back to New York to live with... with this is very incestuous. She went back to New York to live with, with Flash's bass player. And I got the deal for the band, and then she said, I'm not coming back unless Ray can be the bass player. I'm like, what do you mean? We've got a record deal. We start rehearsing next week. No, Ray's got to be in the band. So anyway, I, I paid for, for them to fly out from New York to, to L.A., um, put them both up in, the, in, a, in a motel in, in their um, nuptial bliss, and on the day of the first rehearsals, uh, went to pick, pick them up. Uh, we had rehearsals booked for like two or three months. Went to pick them up, found my wife distraught, saying, he's gone. I went, what, what do you mean he's gone? Uh, Ray, the bass player, had gone, gone out and done a runner. Uh, he'd gone out to get some cigarettes and then taken a cab to the airport <laughs> and gone back to his wife in New York. So we had no bass player. So we had the singer back and no bass player. And I, I didn't tell the management company. Uh, I couldn't, because, you know, it's, it's just... We had these rehearsals booked. So we auditioned about 50 bass players and then finally came up with, with, with the right guy. But, you know, and, and I was... I was thinking, that you know, this is... 
once again, this was before Spinal Tap was, was made, but, but all these chaotic things were just going on and it became a real kind of soap opera thing. You know, and I was just thinking, you know, all I, all I wanted to do was play guitar. Did that, in the end, sort of motivate you then to sort of going back into session work eventually, just, just concentrating on... Eventually, on I, yeah. At eight years, I think, of Empire, doing three albums, it just killed it. Um, and we never did a gig because the singer was insecure about being on stage and she was going to dance classes and not showing up for rehearsals because she wanted to get her body fit for the big performance. And I just got very tired of all that. Um, and we did some, some showcases where we had people from record companies come down to this huge sound stage that we were rehearsing on. We had a, just about every record company in town would come down and often the singer wasn't there. And we were doing long pieces of music and, and um, so, so good music. Um, and it just got to a point where, where we, we didn't do any gigs. And, and the last day of rehearsals, when we'd finally, we got this, this manager um, who'd never managed a band before. And, and he put a lot of his own money in, into paying everybody and paying for the rehearsals. And he just went in it into it without really realising what a soap opera he got himself into. And on the last day, we were going to have a bit of a party and had a catering company in and, and some people had been invited down. And, and I just got... I had a few words with... with you notice I don't mention her name, with, with the singer. And she wasn't happy about something. And this was in the middle of this set, what we were doing, the showcase set. And I said, don't talk about this now. This is not, not the time to do it. Let's just finish playing. And something was said, and I can't remember what, but, but at the end of the, the whole set, um, I really lost my temper. Something doesn't often happen. And I pushed over all the tables and all the food. <laughs> it just went completely berserk. There was food everywhere. And the band were just um, looking, and they were still on the stage. And it, what's happened? And I just said, right, you guys, you stay on there. Let's play now. And we did, we did this this wonderful um, about two hours of, <laughs> of chaotic music, <laughs> and it was great. Unfortunately, the tape had run out, mm. and uh, it was never recorded. But and that, so that was the end of Empire. Um, sad, a waste, a waste of eight years, really. Um, yeah, and I was starting to do sessions. Um, and, and enjoying that more and more and more. Um, played on a, uh, some Shaka Khan things. We had the same management. Yeah, often I was the only white boy in the, in the session. That was with great. Lionel Richie as well, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As though um, that was just can you put a solo on? And I think I had to redo somebody else's solo. Um, not very creative for any of that stuff. You're just sitting there with an engineer and, and you know, it's like, OK, you're three hours, now you're out of here, that kind of thing. But some sessions were fun and, and, and some weren't. But I was never a typical session player because I really ended up sounding like me, which is not always what, what a producer w will want. But, um, yeah, I stuck a toe in the water and, and I did get to play with Lonnie Donegan, um, which, was, which was great. You know, my boy held hero, you know. When I was eight years old, all I wanted... I wanted to be Lonnie Donegan or just walk in the same room as him and Lonnie would go, hi. <laughs> you know, um, and then years later, I ended up doing this session with him with Ringo on drums and um, Adam Faith produced it. And it was all... Actually, it was... Um, it was fun. Um, and Lonnie Donegan was playing in Lake Tahoe and he actually said, he said, I really like your playing. Would you like to join my band? And I just dismissed it and I said, no, thanks. And it wasn't until years later I thought, Lonnie Donegan asked me to join his band and I just went, no, thanks. You know, how weird is that? Well, bringing you up to date with, yeah. with your activity now, um, you mentioning your, your current uh, improvised, improvisation. Band Harmony in got. diversity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's a kind of movable feast um, of, of musicians. Uh, the whole premise behind that, and it's usually a three-piece, so it's guitar, bass and drums, but 
electronic drums. So you can get a, and I use a lot of guitar synthesizer because um, I prefer guitar when it doesn't sound like guitar. But that's completely improvised uh, with no agenda. The only agenda is we don't have an agenda and we don't discuss anything at all. What not what key, what tempo, or anything. And sometimes it's very boring, and sometimes it's absolutely fantastic, or a mixture of, of the two in, in one set. Um, some of the audiences have been very um, attentive and um, almost saintly in, in, in their, um, um, their patience while, while we go through all, all these strange musical moods. Um, I like it a lot. It's a lot of fun. And it's not jazz. Um, there are quite a few improv jazz situations, uh, but nobody's ever done it in, in, in more of a, a rock context and oh the other rule is no 12 bars you know i mean it's, it, and that's about it really um and i like it and it's harmony and diversity because you know the the uh, all the diverse elements of music sometimes can can be in perfect harmony and that's that's the way it works um i'm trying to put my own band together called self-contained which um will be an instrumental band so it'd be guitar, bass, drums, and keyboards. Uh, I'd love to go out and, and do instrumentals, you know, in a similar vein to focus, I guess. Uh, very hard to do to get interest in that because once again, if it's jazz, you can do that. Nobody will question it. But if if it's not jazz, and I hate to use the term rock, but if it's something that that is a little more solid. Um, rock instrumentals, I, I suppose. Um, a lot of promoters are a little scared of that. Um, so I'm still trying to put self-contained together. Um, I've got some great musicians uh, who would love to do it, but it's a question of, of um, you know, get, putting the, the everyday thing together and, and the finance and all those boring things that one must do. But um, I've got great hopes for that. It would be good. You still have your enthusiasm for playing off oh, yeah. these years. Yeah. I, I went for a period of two years with not picking up a guitar at all. Um, and actually, when I came back to the guitar, um, I literally didn't touch one. They were just sitting there on their stands, getting dustier and dustier. And when I came back to it, I was quite surprised that, that, that it was you know, like getting on a bike um, and not falling off. I mean, it was... Um, I hadn't lost... You know the, the dexterity or, or the technique, um, and now it's an excuse for not rehearsing. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I'm 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 kind of lucky, really. I'm uh, yeah, I'm still obsessed with with music. Um, sometimes I prefer listening to play, but um, it's big thing. You know, it's what I do. It's the only thing I I do well. So you know, if you if you can do one step thing well in life, I, I think that's pretty good. Peter Banks, thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you very thank much. You. Be lucky. Mm -hmm.